After 12 manic weeks of bluffing, backstabbing, superstar egos, and transatlantic rivalry, Live Aid Day finally dawned. Everyone was on tenterhooks. Television was still in the Stone Age, and no one had ever done anything like this before. 58 bands, live, over 16 hours, with a temperamental revolving stage and 13 satellites. Would it work? Would anyone watch? And more importantly, would the punters put their hands in their pockets? I didn't get much sleep. Paula had put towels under the sheet because I, I, I had that phenomenon of cold sweat. I was just pacing, and I was on the phone quite a lot still. And I was trying to put off leaving. That's the truth. That, that's right this second what I remember. It's suddenly a blast of that. I remember opening the curtains and seeing a sunny day. And I think it was one of the few, or maybe the only, sunny day that summer. And I thought, wow, something's happening. The magnitude of the day ahead was just beginning to dawn on the reluctant BBC boys fronting the show. I don't really get to sleep, to be honest. Um, I can remember kind of getting up, certainly at about five o'clock, and going for a walk by the river. And at six o'clock, the phone went. It was Andy Kershaw, uh, my old mate, who lived around the corner. He said, hey, Mark, have you got your brown trousers on? <laughs> and I remember being absolutely sick with fear, waiting for the BBC car to come and pick me up. And I lived in Chiswick in those days. And the car had already picked up Mark Allen. And even Mark's uh, <laughs> relentless uh, joshing and wonderful sense of humour in the car up to Wembley couldn't really uh, make me lighten up. But nobody else wanted to miss out. Even Live Aid's toughest press critic, the NME, sent a solitary hack. Yeah, I remember getting the tube train up to North London, and of course all the carriages were packed with um, people going to Live Aid, and it struck me this wasn't a typical concert-going audience of the kind that I was used to from the 70s and the 80s. This wasn't a rock audience as such, this really was Middle England. Shorts and t-shirts, big bags yeah, yeah. full of drinks yeah, and sandwiches, litres. just in case we died of starvation <laughs> in London. <laughs> yeah, definitely two litres of weak orange squash, I vividly remember that, with a handle. <laughs> Everybody was nice. <laughs> Nobody was going to be horrible to each other. You could just feel that. Everybody was smiling. Ah, yeah, ah, yeah. You know, everybody was just terribly excited. At 10 o'clock, the dam burst. And Ali just went, run! <laughs> we all ran across Wembley Stadium. It was just, it was awesome, it was absolutely awesome just to get in there and see all the stage set up and just a fantastic feeling. While the fans staked out their turf, just across the river, a massive airlift was getting underway. Jason, 300 persons on board and you're fine. The stars were in the air and their pilot was TV presenter Noel Edmonds. There was no space to land helicopters at Wembley, and the nearest spot that we could find was the other side of the tube line where there is a cricket pitch. The first point of contact pointed out to us there was a very important cricket match on that day. 
And we said, well, it's Live Aid. The world is watching. This is the only place that we can land. I said, but it's a very important cricket match. We've got this. This could only happen in this country. So all these guys in their whites, you know, sort of ready at the bat. And next thing you know, it was up with the stumps. This in they ran. Blah blah blah. Out came Bono in a car, Range Rover off. Back in the stumps. Where were we? You know, back on. I got there in a helicopter. Yes, um, from my house in Windsor. Because of, uh, not being grand or anything like that, because I just thought the fucking traffic would be a nightmare. Elton was going through a particularly interesting period um, in the follicle department. And it was pointed out that when he arrived at Wembley, the rotors of the helicopter had to be stationary <laughs> for fear that the draft could cause the Elton rug to become detached. He was very worried about his wig. However, on the day, what he should have been concerned about was his garden. I wasn't too happy because we just planted some things in the garden and the, the helicopter um, took off and, and more or less destroyed everything that we'd done in that summer trying to plant the, the, the things that we did. And the words that came out of Elton's mouth were just, my fucking begonias, I've just had them done. Others were enjoying a different kind of trip. I remember circling over the place in a helicopter. At least I think I was in a helicopter. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. Uh, before we went on, and uh, obviously before we went on. And it was just such an amazing sight. I shall never forget that, over the stadium. It, it just looked so fantastic. <laughs> looking down into a, a sea of mullets. I think I even had one myself back then. They were very popular. Uh, and that just, that crackle of an anticipation. At 10 minutes to 12, and the time is now 13 minutes to 12, on the two big screens to the side of the stage, the world. 72,000 people sweltered in the baking heat. I find it incredible that the, sort of, the mass of people probably feel that something should be done, yet their own governments just don't do anything. They do very little. You know, it's, the very fact that it has to be done by people giving their own money is it's ridiculous. I mean, we've given enough money into government, why can't they spend some of our money giving it back? Perfectly honest, we were into the music scene. <laughs> and, um, OK, it was a good cause, but I don't think at that age we maybe should have been, but our first priority was having a good time in the music. Backstage, nobody seemed to know what was going on. There were a lot of people walking about in clipboard, with clipboards and, and headphones and, and looking as though they knew what they were doing. <laughs> Which, of course, in hindsight, was that nobody knew what was going on at all. Uh, and it was full of, full of pop stars sort of looking quite vacant. The words of wisdom, let it be. What time is it? It's Christmas time. There's no need to be afraid. At Christmas time. While the stars tuned up, Geldof was his usual manic self. When we got there, I, I saw him. He, he was uh, on a phone next to one of those huge trailers, and he was saying, Fuck off! No! Stick it up your ass! And I thought, well, God, I wonder if it's the right time to say hello. So I, <laughs> I wandered up and I said, hi, Bobby. He went, oh, good, you're here. Hello, Pam, how you doing? Oh, good, I'm glad you're here, blah, 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 and it's going great, and tra-la-la. And I said, somebody on your, on your back there. He said, ach! <laughs> somebody wanted to put Santana on next. He said, the fucking crap. <laughs> <laughs> this guy from the from the Boomtown Rats is telling me that Santana are crap. I think not. Wrap your arms around the world yeah. at Christmas time.
With all the chaos backstage, the production crew forgot all about the imminent arrival of the royal couple. It was a mad rush to hit the phones. You've got to come early. Why do I come early? I'm on at 6 o'clock, 7 o'clock at night. Amazingly, everyone came. Rock stars don't get up, do they? But no, if you see the footage, everyone's there. And everyone was there to meet Britain's most glamorous royal. And she got to me and, and my manager said, uh, this is Nick Kershaw. And she said, I know who he is, which I was very pleased about. The princess died, said to well, didn't realise he was so short. And I said, surely he's a fucking midget. She was completely flirtatious, actually. She was a real sort of, you know, hi. And I'm sure she said something of sort of slightly naughty extract. I seem to remember it was something to do with underwear or suspenders or something a little fruity. All these grown pop stars being completely jelly at Princess Diana Attorney, all going, oh, you know, like schoolboys. While stars were being smitten, Television producers were racing against time to write the biggest introduction in television history. With seconds to go, I got a, a little voice in my earpiece saying, um, the royal party are not going on stage, they're going straight to the royal box, so you will have to do the opening. Oh, will we? He dictated to me with my hands, you know, and I wrote out these words, it's 12 noon in London, 7 a.m. in Philadelphia, um, read it to myself a couple of times quietly, gave a bit of voice lever on the microphone, and before you knew it, it was 30 seconds, good luck. And he started to read it, and he'd read the first two or three words, when suddenly they switched the PA on in the stadium. It's 12 noon, and then it goes, it's 12 noon! It's 12 noon in London, 7 a.m. in Philadelphia. And around the world, it's time for Live Aid. And then there was this extraordinary moment where Richard and I just embraced each other and, f and cried. We were, we, were, we were both quite overcome. It was just kind of, it started, we were all right. Geldof had chosen the opening act weeks earlier, but they weren't everyone's favourite vintage. Some chap says, who's opening the show? And uh, Bob went, well, it's obvious who's going to open the show. It's status quo. Working all over the world. And I went, oh, no, I'm not sure about that. Even in 1985, it seemed as if status quo had been around forever, doing exactly the same riff <laughs> over and over, wearing the same clothes. And it was behind me when the announcement was made that status quo were coming on first. And he just turned around and said, oh, fucking stand status quo. In all the years that we'd been together, even by then, by 85, um, you know, we weren't necessarily nervous before a gig, bit of nervous energy, but I was really cacking myself before we went out there, you know. Would you welcome status quo? But looking at the crowds just before they started the opening bars, you know, the hairs on the back of the neck were standing up. And I was standing there with Tony Hadley, who's about seven foot three, isn't it? And, um, and you could hear in your headphones, five, four, three, two, one. went up, everyone's clapping, arms above the head. I look behind me and there's Andy. 
you fucking hypocrite. No one would admit it except me, but we thought status quo were quite cool when they played. Secretly, you wanted to hate yourself for thinking that, but they were great when they came on. <laughs> Tony Hadley, I just looked up at him, he looked down at me, and we both burst into tears. The ex-punk Bob Geldof, who'd once written a song knocking the British Empire, was now hobnobbing with his new best friend, the Prince. And he said, who are these chips you for doing? And I, and I said, oh, that's uh, status quo, sir. And he said, you, who, who exactly are they, you know? And, and I said, um, well, you know, I said, I asked them particularly because they're um, almost a cartoon of rock and roll. He says, you extra bend, and he was sort of clapping arrhythmically <laughs> and stuff like that. He would have enjoyed a sort of chamber orchestra type of setup, more than a sort of, um, you know, the cream of the world's glitterati, fritterati and whatever, and um, she loved it. She just loved it. I'm sure she would have married Phil Collins if he'd asked her. For us to open it, it that doesn't bother us at all. Fantastic. Best spot, mm. sod clothes in it, can you imagine? Across the Atlantic, America was getting ready to join the fray. But one loose cannon threatened disaster. American concert promoter Bill Graham was an angry, difficult control freak. He'd been heading for a showdown with the TV producers. Now, with minutes to go, he tried to restrict their access. About a half hour prior to the show starting, Bill had a... Uh, our TV badges pulled. Couldn't go to the stage. So all I had was distant cameras. So uh, I got my attorneys and said, I, I want him either removed off the premises or taken out of our um, operational uh, issues um, or we're, you know, we're yanking it. The police came in with Mike Mitchell. They were going to arrest Bill Graham for trespass because <laughs> they wanted to get rid of him. And I called, I called Bob right away and I said, Bob, it's not going to happen. We'll handle the situation. We'll deal with Bill. And we finally got everybody to leave. Everybody calm down. A deal was struck. The promoter was banished to the stage area but he was still looking for trouble. We had not only been asked to build a, not only a small reproduction, but a 500-seat uh, Hard Rock Cafe backstage uh, next to the artist area. And uh, Mr. Graham came rolling in there a couple of hours before the whole concert. He had not been over there. Who in the fuck authorized this? That's what he said. <laughs> and uh, actually, it was him. <laughs> As the Wembley concert continued, behind the scenes, the money started to trickle in. 23,000 pounds in the first few minutes. Volunteers manned 300 BBC phone lines to take donations, but Geldof was still anxious. I thought that people wouldn't watch. I thought that people wouldn't give money. I thought that the political lobby, which so interested me that I could raise this day, would just be w wasted, so all that wasted. And here now is the band that's led by the man who was the spark, Bob Geldof and the Boomtown Rat. Geldof's own band hadn't had a hit in years. Would they get the money rolling in? I tried to talk Bob out of performing. I felt it was a bit strange. I don't actually know what he felt about it. I felt 
uncomfortable. But he wanted to do it. And indeed, you could, you could argue that had anybody else organised this, the Boomtown Rats would not have got a 15-minute slot at Live <laughs> They were very nervous and very self-conscious and probably felt a little bit rusty and, and out of their depth. But the fact was, everyone did want to see Bob Geldof. In fact, I, I would say, on the day, he was as big as anyone else. People really wanted to see the man who'd made it all happen. His mind was not at that much, but once he went on stage, he was back in the band. And so for 10 or 15 minutes, he was back in the Boomtown Rats and he was playing the gig, and, and that was great. He stopped two thirds of the way through the song. The lesson today is how to die. We've been learning that the lesson today is how to die. Because it's not normally a break in the song, but the crowd have gone mental. Bob keeps his hand up for what seemed forever. And suddenly, that line took a completely different meaning. Minutes later, it was the turn of Geldof's band aid partner Midgeur to face the crowds. His chart topping band Ultravox had been billed as one of the show's highlights. It was petrifying walking out there, but the roar, the crowd was just fantastic. It must be how a gladiator felt or, a, or a, how a football hero feels walking on to that thing, you know, to, to walk onto this massive roar of recognition. The rest of it just disappeared. I would argue the toss now that we weren't on stage for 18 minutes. You were no sooner on, you'd maybe started to break sweat if you were lucky, and then you were off. You were gone again. Ultravox should have played earlier, at 12.47, but after a last-minute change to the running order, they were swapped with the Boomtown Rats. This meant that by the time Midge and his boys came on, the royal party had left. As I walked backstage, all the paparazzi were there. And they said, well, how do you feel being shafted by Bob? And I said, what do you mean? He said, well, you were swapped round with the Boomtown Rats so that he could perform for the Royals. I said, nah, 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 nah. Said, yeah. The Prince and Princess of Wales had agreed to stay for a couple of hours, and so there was a bit of jockeying for position. And it was felt that it was right for Bob to, if he was going to perform, to perform within that period in front of them. Someone who was organising the uh, the technical side of things, came up to me and said, oh, there's a problem, Adamant's equipment, um, do you mind if the rats go on before you? And I said, no, don't care, it doesn't matter. It was then quite obvious that, you know, those four bands were, were, were playing in front of the royal family. Midge is very keen on the royal family, was keen to play in front of them. Um, but it was decided it wasn't to be, and he was very, very upset about it. But there you go, you know. 
Yeah, it's just the way it is, isn't it? That's the point. It actually wasn't my decision. Probably Bob's decision, really, to decide that he wanted to be on at that point. Oh, bastard. <laughs> it probably was Bob, yeah. Well, I thought, I, 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 I have, um, I've given him the benefit of the doubt and said, well, you know, I'm sure he knows nothing about it and it was just a, a swap round. I didn't even know we'd been swapped you know, on the day. I certainly wouldn't have requested that. I couldn't give a toss, just so long as we were on, you know. I, I insisted upon that, that's for bloody sure, you know. Whoever gave the go-ahead for the swap, Midjur felt slighted. But I think the thing that hurt most was, as a Band-Aid trustee, I was lied to. And it, it was unnecessary, it didn't have to happen. But the show had to go on. Some of the outfits were a bit over the top. Spandau Ballet looked like they'd borrowed their mum's blouses to play to one and a half billion people. All right, well my nerves started to go. It was knowing that when you walked on stage, you were walking out in front of millions of people worldwide who would be watching and would always say, I remember your show, it was awful, as you couldn't get it wrong. played at Wembley Stadium and for me it was like being in the FA Cup final. It was a dream come true to be honest. And I remember going around in this big leather coat on sweats coming down, you know, and the swung round. And the mics just come flying out my hand. And I was like, oh no. I tried to be cool and, ha-ha, hey. <laughs> Could if I had a gun, I would have shot myself at that moment. Thank you! But there was no respite for the BBC team, marooned in the Wembley commentary box. Their lack of rehearsal was beginning to show. And it, we're going to go straight down there, I think, because I think they've already started. I don't know what's going on. I'm to clue. I think. There was mad panic throughout the whole day. Of, what do we do now? Oh, I've no idea. Sorry, I didn't realise how was on. I'm now joined by TV's... The heat was on, and it was getting hotter by the minute. Because it was so hot in the box, we had these portable air conditioning machines, which were worse than useless, because they were so noisy, of course, you had to turn them off as soon as the lights were on, which meant that just when you needed them, you couldn't use them. And some guy came up at one stage to fix the air conditioning machines, and we thought he was famous, so we sat him down. <laughs> and we were within a hair's breadth of interviewing, uh, you, you know, the man from the AC company. Probably think he was from ACDC, I don't know. While mayhem ruled in the BBC box, the unstoppable global jukebox played on, with contributions now coming in from all over Europe. It's not that you can sing again the sun. Hello, this is Vienna, Austria, a small country, but we are very happy. Hello, Hello world. world. 
Hello, this is Hilversum in Holland. We... Hello from the JRT studio in Belgrade, Yugoslavia. We are happy and proud to be with you this morning. Are you the case may be. And to deliver your message from the US. Are you the One after the other, the cream of British music talent took to the revolving stage, which mercifully worked to plan. People all over the country were celebrating the day. In a farmer's field in Cheshire, 5,000 locals gathered to watch on a giant screen. We hope to raise a fair bit of money, and uh, we hope to achieve a, a, just a, a feeling of actually being able to do something. We had too many coaches full of pensioners, all the pensioners in the village, and uh, my Uncle Jim. And they all rolled up, they all came, you know. So do you like the music? Some of it, not all of it. I think the whole movement's inspired everybody. Just everywhere. You know, the whole world, isn't it? I mean, I've given more to charity with this one than I've ever given any time. This is called Against All Odds. Just let you walk away Just let you leave without a trace Phil Collins was to perform live in London and Philadelphia, where rock and roll giants Led Zeppelin invited him to join their set. There was just time for a quick chat with that friend of the stars, Andy Kershaw. I did feel some unease about having to um, rub shoulders with and uh, in, in some cases, interview uh, a lot of pop stars who I didn't actually detest personally, but whose music I was well known for not liking. Andy's style was to say, Oi, you, speaking as a wanker, what do you think? And if you said to him, uh, I think you've got to introduce Howard Jones now, um, he'd go, Oh, And said, oh, come on, Andy, come along, it's all for the starving kids, it'll be all right. <laughs> So, at one point, I found myself sitting around with the holy trinity of Sting, Phil Collins, and, and the ubiquitous Howard Jones. Well, this is a BBC economy measure. We've only got one microphone and one was all crowding a bit. Hello, how, do you, how do you two lads come to get together to collaborate on this one? Performers uh, whose music, for me, epitomised everything that was bland, mainstream, insipid, Tragic, uh, gave rock and roll a bad name. I, I was a bit nervous about that actually because I thought, well, he's not going to like me. I just wondered that he might like have a go or something. We we'll just have a quick word with Howard. <laughs> it's, it's been an expensive trip for you, I understand. Was it was it worth it for just the five minutes on stage? I, 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 it would have been worth it just to do one one note. I think. I, mean... I think that's the moment where I told Phil Collins to shove off. What are you doing here anyway? Because I thought you ought to be on Concord oh, and heading for America. Will you shove off? Go on. Which is just like, I don't know if you can be much ruder, really. I don't think so. <laughs> <laughs> The race was on to get Collins to Heathrow in time for his transatlantic flight, courtesy of Concord. Listen, whose idea was this whole trip, this Philadelphia idea? No idea. No, it was, um, we thought if it could be done, wouldn't it be good to do it? And then it went in, we went into the logistics. And I said, uh, I'm not going to be the only one doing it, am I? Because it's a bit, it's a bit show-offy. And they said, no, no, there's going to be a few other people who are going to be doing it. But everyone blamed poor old Phil. Although I thought Phil was being a complete prick when, that, when he first asked that, I thought, you know, come on, man, what are we doing this for? It actually was one of our highlights. As we know, nobody else did it. <laughs> that was the only stupid one doing it. 
Now, you may have heard that earlier Phil Collins performed here with Sting and that he was helicoptered out of here to Heathrow. Mid-flight, the supersonic pop star was due to be brought back down to earth for a studio chat. When I got taken into the, the cockpit, the captain said, um, you're going to have a word with London now. Now, I'm not supposed to let you do this, but, so please don't tell anybody. <laughs> and then he gave me the, the mic, you know, this sort of... <laughs> to beam to two million people. Somewhere way up in the sky over the Atlantic in Concord. I couldn't hear anything. There's, they say, and now there's magic of, of, of electronics and engineering. <laughs> We're going to talk to Phil Collins. I was dying to talk to him. And I wish I could have spoken to him because I would have told him not to sing the same song when he got there. But, but I just got... <laughs> Very nice to be here. Uh, I've been to Cockpit here with these wonderful chaps. I'm glad you jumped in, Phil. I'm not sure I did your own really. What do you do? Uh, it goes on and it goes on, and we're all looking at each other on the ground going, they've got to pull this in a minute, <laughs> but it kept going. I'm stunned. I'm absolutely flabbergasted. Apart from the fact that I didn't hear a word, I have to believe you <laughs> come in your ear. <laughs> But I don't know how those things work. I don't know how regular telephones work. Far less phone in an aeroplane. You've got two cocoa tins and a bit of string, have you? Yes, That's I'm amazing. still there. Yeah. Back on Earth, Philadelphia was standing by to go live at 5 o'clock in the afternoon, 12 noon East Coast time. For one performer at Wembley, it was a particularly nail-biting experience. Just coming to terms with the fact that 100,000 people were going to see us. Then Bob made it even worse, because she said, America's going to go live halfway through your act. So I'm going to be on the side. When you see me appear at the side of the stage, when you're in that number, I'm going to come on. So I thought, great. So now I'm panicking, because I've never played a stadium panicking because somewhere during the show I'm going to be worldwide live and I've got to keep one eye over this way for Bob. Wembley, will you please welcome America to Live Aid Day? Hello America, welcome to the world. Have a great day. Have a good day. Over in Philadelphia, their first act, an equally nervous Brian Adams, was waiting to play to the world. Have a good day. We were sort of standing on the side of the stage, you guys says, all right, Brian, that gentleman over there is going to be introducing you. Uh, just so you know, you're the first person that's going live to, to the UK, and um, so make sure you say hello to London. <clears throat> I said, okay. And uh, wait for that gentleman's cue, and then you can start. I said, okay. So I looked over, and it was Jack Nicholson introducing me. Brian Adams. In the middle of a tour, he's come here to entertain you. Hey, Philadelphia! Hello, London! Hello, world! This is the summer of 69. <laughs> My first real six string Body at the five and ten Played till my fingers bled Was the summer of 69 We had some guys from school Got a band to try to rewind Jimmy Quinn, Jody got married Should've known we'd never get by When I look back now From now on, viewers across the globe could follow the action as it switched between Wembley and Philadelphia. In Britain, 
millions tuned in to watch the first national live TV event since the wedding of Prince Charles and Lady Di. Later in the afternoon, about tea time, I was sent back to TV Centre to do some video editing. And I was sitting in a car with all the, all the windows open, it was such a hot day. And at no point from Wembley Stadium to Television Centre in Shepherd's Bush did we need to put a radio on. From the houses we drove past, you could just hear Live Aid. It was everywhere. Um, and that was the moment, I think, that it really struck me that culturally this was going to have a massive impact. And as I drove up, uh, seeing all the windows open, it was one of those, it was like a jubilee day. It was like a sort of big British celebration. You could hear it coming out of every window, every street you went down. So I ended up kind of staking out the television and saying, well, no one's coming near it because I'm just going to watch it right the way through. And I did, I just sat there and watched, watched it right the way through on a brilliantly beautiful summer's day in South Wales. <laughs> Around the world, one and a half billion people, 165 countries were tuning in to see, share, and participate in the same event. I had to be there, I had to see it, I had to know what was going on, and I did. It was my education, it was my school of rock. Today is something unique. We never seen westernized country before. We always heard by the radio, and is a chance to see on the television. They are involving the people, hi America, and they are in UK. And, and the, the American people say, hi India. And people like me, oh my God, they are looking to me. You know, they, oh yeah, they talk about India, you know. Live Aid was the first major demonstration of the potential for global satellite communications. Here the world was participating in an event. The Germans were participating, the Japanese were participating, we had uh, the Russians, the Australians. We were bringing people together throughout the world. We were showing we were, we were a global village, we are one humanity. Further groundbreaking moves were afoot. In 1985, the West and Russia were at the height of the Cold War. The threat of nuclear attack was never far away. To ignore the facts of history and the aggressive impulses of an evil empire, to simply call the arms race a giant misunderstanding, and thereby remove yourself from the struggle between right and wrong and good and evil. But for the first time, a TV concert was about to bring the Russians in from the chill. Once again, to prove that this is a totally international show today, we're moving abroad for the first time ever seen in the West, one of the most popular Soviet groups. Live from Moscow, here's Autograph. I had been told that Russia was standing by, and the music was ready, and uh, the band was ready. <laughs> And as soon as we cut to Russia, up came a scene of cherry pickers. And we thought, that's very strange. Maybe this is how the Russians interpret Western videos. You start off thinking, I suspect they know what they're doing, and you know, in a minute, somebody will come on and, uh, and say, well, those very cherries that are being picked now are being bundled up and sent to Ethiopia. The cherry pickers continued to gather their harvest for two more baffling minutes until a technician, deep in the bowels of Russian television, finally switched the feed. We were watching pictures from Bulgaria, a documentary about fruit picking, and getting the sound out of Russia with the band playing. So we had this weird period of time when nobody really knew what the hell was going on. Not for the first or the last time. In 1985, 
You too were rising stars. They hadn't yet cracked the international stage, but that didn't stop them from being difficult. Only the night before, they threatened to pull out. Would they come good on the day? distance between stage and crowd. I don't like the distance between performer and audience. So I'm looking for a symbol of the day, something that, yeah, that I can hold on to. And I saw her down there getting crushed. I said, that, that's it. I've been good at distances. I don't think he realised that when she climbed down that there was like a two mile walk to go to the punters. <laughs> and I didn't know when I was holding on to her I would be holding on to the rest of the world, really. Because everyone wanted to be... Everyone was shaken, is the truth. People were disturbed. They knew that this kind of wall that they had built up, that we had built up between the us and them was coming down. Bonner was lost in his own world, but the rest of the band couldn't see where he'd got to and were beginning to panic. How long can we do this for? <laughs> it was like, this is on and on. It, it, was, it was kind of excruciating. And we didn't know whether we should stop. We didn't know where he was. We didn't know if he'd fallen. And uh, we sort of, and you know, just just as we we're about to like stop, and um, just just climbs back up onto the uh, onto the stage. We were kind of annoyed afterwards because we felt like you know we'd blown an opportunity to you know to be great. It was it was it was our stage, and um, so we felt a little angry about that. I always felt, oh shit, it's all going wrong, when in actual fact it wasn't, it was actually all going right. They seem to have a grandeur about them. I think Live Aid was the point at which uh, U2 became a big stadium band. It really was the making of U2 as an international act. Crap sound, crap haircuts, and we and didn't end up playing the, the hit "Pride in the Name of Love" because the singer fucked off into the crowd. Band wanted to fire me as a result, and it turned out to be one of the best days of our life. Explain that. Ask God. He probably knows. Thank you. God bless you. Bono wowed the crowd, but he didn't have quite the same effect on two female coppers working backstage. A photographer came up and uh, he asked us, would we mind having our photo taken with this chap? And we entered into the spirit of the thing, <laughs> didn't we, Ira? We did. <laughs> and said, yes, we don't mind. And uh, so he stood in between Iris and I and he had a can of beer in his hand and he gave us a kiss and the photo was taken. And when I come around, I said, well, who was that? <laughs> and uh, he said, that's Bono. And I said, Bono who? And he said, you too. <laughs> and I said, you too what? <laughs> we hadn't got a clue who he was. More than anyone else, stadium supergroup Dire Straits kept their eye anxiously on the clock throughout their set. 
The megastars were in the middle of their sellout tour at Wembley Arena, down the road, and they had to get back there for their own gig an hour later. And of course, we had to go back almost immediately to do our regular performance to the 12,000 Dire Straits fans who would much rather have actually been at the Live Aid gig, but they'd already bought their tickets, so they were stuck. <laughs> Getting away from the Wembley crowds wasn't as easy as getting in, but once again, two ladies in blue came to the rescue. When the chap came up, we were backstage, and he said to me, we're in Dyer Straits, we need to get our stuff out quick. And I said, no problem. And we found the Wembley security, and I said, these blokes are in Dyer Straits, and they need <laughs> to get out quick, they've got to be down at a venue and he couldn't stop laughing. And he said, but they are dire straits, that's their name. <laughs> the world was watching, but the money wasn't flooding in, and Geldof was beginning to panic. I didn't dare ask were we making any money? That's the truth, I was afraid to ask. And eventually I had to. And they said, yeah, it's going great. And I said, Jesus, you know, like how much? And it was pathetic, I think one and a half million. And it was truly pathetic and I freaked out. Bob was just fed up with the fact that uh, we were not putting enough appeals into the programme and didn't appear to be remembering. Uh, the purpose of the programme. Geldof headed for the BBC box up in the gantries, just as Queen were getting ready to go on stage. I see a little silhouette of a man. Scaramouche, Scaramouche, will you do the fandango? Thunderbolt and lightning, very, very frightening me. Galileo, 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 Galileo Picaro. The flamboyant rockers had been massive in the 70s, but many now thought they were past it. For Live Aid, we were, we were bored, I think. We were, we were quite, we'd, we'd had a, a long, fairly long career by then. Um, and I think we were in a bit of a trough. Queen had played at Sun City in South Africa during the um, apartheid era. I think that anybody that has played there, I don't want to... Actually, I won't mention names. Rod Stewart and Queen and people like that have played there. The jerks for doing it, and uh, they, are, they were more than aware of what they were doing, and I think that they should be uh, called out for it. And for them, subsequently to appear at Live Aid as, uh, as the benefactors of Africa, struck some people as being hypocritical. It's interesting that they, they were the most nervous backstage. They were the most... They'd been arguing, they'd fallen out. They thought Queen didn't matter anymore. Anyway, uh, it gives us enormous pleasure to introduce the next combo, who are... Uh... Her Majesty! Queen! I do remember, I think we were quite tense, quite tense before we went on. Just hoping it was all going to work, you know, that the equipment wouldn't break down. So would Freddie and the boys pull it off? stole the show. Queen were Live Aid. Queen was, was one of the seminal moments in the history of the 20th century. Forget Hitler, forget the invention of the internet or whatever. Queen's performance was absolutely A1. So it's Queen's day, I think. Yeah. They just stole <clears> the show. Best thing there. Yeah. Fantastic. Up shots. On his way to berate the BBC, 
Geldof stopped in his tracks. When I was walking along the top, and I looked out, and they started, and I saw the radio gaga. <laughs> Just thought, this is extraordinary. Radio Goo Goo, Radio Gaga, all we hear is Radio Gaga. This was pop history in the making. Radio Gaga. Every single person in that whole place was clapping along to Radio Gaga and singing along. I thought, oh, fantastic, I wish we had a song like that. Freddie's command of the crowd even stretched across the Atlantic. But looking out onto the audience, 90,000 Philadelphians, you know, on cue with a television screen. I just thought that was powerful, really powerful. And yeah, that brought us together. That was the one moment I thought, we don't have to be in London. We're here and we're part of it. Freddie Mercury was only just getting started. I can't tell you what it feels like to be on a stage like that, in that situation where you have no control. And, you know, there is an infinite space underneath your feet if you fall, you know. It would be appalling if you really screw up, you know. And Freddie just thinks, oh, what the hell, you know, hey old. Response. Freddie would call, they would respond. And they loved it. They wanted to do it. A, fa a fascinating kind of power. I do remember coming away from that concert thinking I must go and buy a Queen album immediately like the rest of the world. And I think Queen got a huge resurgence of interest. Just as Queen were finishing their set, Geldof stormed into the BBC box, still fuming about the failure to raise enough money. So I was wound up by how great this was, having seen these guys, being magnificent. And um, suddenly I'm there and it's cosy, you know, celeb. DJ poptastic stuff. I've been joined, as you can see, by Pamela Stevenson, Billy Connolly, Ian Asprey from the Celt, and once again Bob Geldof. From it's all a bit telethonish, and that wasn't what this is, you know. I mean, the the thing calling a charity did and drove me nuts. For me, this was finely tuned politics. You know, you've got to get on the phone and take the money out of your pocket. Don't go to the pub tonight, please. Stay in and give us the money. There are people dying now, let's so give me the money. And here's the numbers. We let's read go about... through the way. No. We're probably going to get the address just... first, aren't we? What the fuck? We've got satellites. We've got space shuttles or not. We've got Concorde. We've got, you know, what's it? Right. You know, it seemed to me of another time. This notion that you do telethons, you do charity concerts, you do smashy and nice, you do, you know, shut up. No, let's fuck the address, let's get the numbers, because <laughs> that's how we're going to get it. And I'm thinking, actually, what everybody, every embarrassed TV presenter is thinking in those circumstances, I do hope my mother's not watching this. I think we're going to have to have the address first, and the address which you can... He's you can in like a burning you elephant, you know. <laughs> Give me your fucking money and I'll come and get you. <laughs> I'll, I'll kill your family. It's a sort of regular feature, though, of uh, life with Bob after, <laughs> after a time. And so it came to pass. Geldof became famous for something he didn't actually say. Give us your fucking money. Give us your fucking money. Give us your money. Give us your fucking money. No. Give us your fucking money. And it was brilliant. And everyone was going, yes, yes. So it forever will be 
give me the fucking money. Like, and I get it all the time going down the street. Unfortunately, it's my one gift to the nation. Give me the fucking money, you know? So, <laughs> uh, but I didn't say it. Stay in and give us the money. There are people dying now, so but... give me the money. And from that moment onwards, the, uh, the lines just went mad. So uh, Bob's uh, deliberate uh, uh, use of the swear word uh, triggered this fantastic and immediate reaction. Tonight, a tense Goldorf was summoned to the phone, and the appeal claimed its biggest individual donation from the ruling family of Dubai. A million quid. A million quid. Well done. Fantastic. Great. While Geldof's language shocked punters into parting with their cash, in Philadelphia, promoter Bill Graham was still on the prowl. Simple minds were overrunning, and Graham resorted to his usual star-handling tactics. Bill at that point has got me almost in a headlock. <laughs> You told me these guys have this song the last four minutes or three minutes. Or whatever. I said, well, Bill, what do you want to do? Go and stop them. There's a billion people watching the telly. I mean, look, I'll just I'll tell them to cut the set to two songs. Right. I get up behind Mel Gainer on drums and say, we'll need to cut them after this song. And uh, so the word somehow or other gets to Jim as he's finishing the second song. Tumultuous applause, great reception. And of course, somehow or other, they've caught up on time. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye bye. The band go to walk off, and Bill goes, What are they doing to me? And I said, Well, you just told us. Don't, don't be stupid, get the money again, you know. And something else, okay, get on, go on, go on, go on. Some old pros got temperatures soaring. But other young Turks didn't quite hit the right note. It would be very cruel of me to, uh, to actually pick on anybody and say, uh, they weren't great, because this happened or whatever. But um, there is the famous Simon Le Bon Yodel. All the times to go and do that. At the time, I was mortified. Absolutely mortified. I'd been, we'd been rehearsing for two days. And I'd given myself a bit of a sore throat doing that because we'd just hammered it and hammered it and hammered it. We've all done it, but, you know, don't do it in front of all those people, Simon. Please. And no one who was present would ever be able to forget a certain pop diva's behavior backstage. Suddenly these minders came in and said, okay, everyone clear the area. And I was sitting with Jim Kerr chatting to him and, and you know, we're from Glasgow. I went, no, why? They went, just clear the area. I went, no, <laughs> we're just not clearing the area. And in came Madonna and Madonna wanted to use the toilet. <laughs> so she didn't want anywhere near her. So of course we just sat outside the portal going. <laughs> she was in. <laughs> and then as soon as she came out again, she stood up and went, I'd give it a few minutes before you use that one. <laughs> In London, another diva, emboldened by his stage performance, was honing his seduction skills. I want to break free. So when Freddie Mercury comes up to me and goes, hello, mm, we've all agreed that we like you. And I went, oh. And he had me up against a wall, and Freddie was being really playful with me. 
And I walked off and I went, he's, he's really very camp, isn't he? Somebody said, Queen. <laughs> He got me in an arm lock, like this, you see. He said, it's all right, darling, I'm not going to hug you. And uh, so I thought, wow. Is he Welsh, then? He was Welsh when I was with him. And I thought, well, if he wanted to, he could have done. And uh, there was a little learning curve there, because I thought, up until now, I thought that gay men were kind of feeble. Freddie wasn't. If Freddie wanted you, he was going to have you. So Freddie's got my hand still after talking for two minutes and he's not letting go which the um, the cool guys thought was just hysterical they're snorting away in the corner and uh, and then he completely blew it for me by saying but you, you're that lovely boy in the boomtown rats aren't you i said no I said, i'm the lovely boy from ultravox Back on stage, David Bowie had the crowd eating out of his hand. Bowie finished his set early, and the mood was about to change. Bob asked me if there's any way that I could find a place uh, to show um, this wonderful video that the cast had uh, put their song to. And I think I cut my set short a bit so that they could use the video. God bless you, you're the heroes of this concert. Lest we forget why we're here, I'd like to introduce a video made by CBC Television. The subject speaks for itself. Thank you. Good night. Please send your money in. It was a moment the audience in the stadium and at home would never forget. The atmosphere completely changed. I mean, completely changed. It went icy cold. It was the most extreme set of emotions I've ever experienced. And I'll never, I'll never have that again. I know that. I remember looking that way, I remember the screen being to the right and everyone yeah. looking at it and just crying and it was, yeah. I remember the woman next to me hugging me. Yeah. Everybody, it was very emotional, I think. Yeah. The drive film was a bludgeon. The fuck was a slap. 
This was a club across the head. And I'm watching this thing, and this wee boy, he, he just, he's, I'm getting very moved even as I speak about it. He, he just, he was like this, all of a sudden. Now, a child shouldn't, it's a position a child should never be in. It's like an old guy in a domino's hut in the, in the public park. And as the music was so beautiful, and then he went like that, you know, he put his head in his hand, this wee guy. He said, he's only a baby. He's only starting. He doesn't know what's going on, he did that. And I just couldn't, I, I wasn't in control of it. It just went, Psh. sitting there and I'm just aware that, that, you know, I'm filling up a little bit, but, you know, Billy and Pamela are just tears rolling down. And clearly that experience was being replicated in living rooms all across the, all across the UK and probably beyond. Well, it's pictures like that that started this whole thing off. And there's not really much you can say after seeing those. Uh, makes music the video was a revelation for one skeptic um, watching the concert at home in Hertfordshire. She was the Red Cross nurse in Ethiopia who had originally sparked Geldof's compassion. It suddenly dawned on me that actually they were fighting as hard as I was in, in e for Ethiopia. And I wanted to talk to them and apologise for my feelings back in, in December when, the, when I first heard band-aid singing do they know it's Christmas and I wanted to apologize to them and say this is fantastic you're marvelous I'm sorry I had these bad thoughts the phone lines lit up again the money was now rolling in at 20,000 pounds a minute Live Aid was galvanizing the nation as never before. I would have been one of millions of people who had been slightly floundering with this. What, what can you do? And where do you give money to? And, of course, they made it very easy for you. <laughs> I remember before Live Aid, when you thought about giving to Africa, it was that rather dreary envelope from Christian Aid that used to land on the doorstep, you know, with a, an oxen ploughing a furrow and you'd maybe sort of put a pound in it and send it off. Um, but this was suddenly trendy. You know, it was, it was pop stars and it was popular culture. And giving was hip. Collins made it onto the stage at Philadelphia with seconds to spare. It was a bridge to tie the two concerts together. He was about to realize his dream, playing live with Led Zeppelin, who reformed especially for Live Aid. Thank you very much. I'd like to introduce some friends of mine to you. Would you welcome Mr. Robert Plant? America, boy, they were huge. And this was like, Zeppelin, man, shit. You know, this was, this was the second coming. Before the set, he went backstage to meet the band. But there's a strange thing that when the Zeppelin guys get together, there was this black cloud, you know, the whole atmosphere changed, darkness. And I remember, arriving and going into the trailer and saying, hi guys, okay. So, and Jimmy Page said, so how does it go? Stay with heaven, huh? How does it go? So I said, well, you know, I know where, this is where I come in and I go, da 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 da, -da, -da. He said, no, no. And I thought, okay. <laughs> it was like I was being torn up, taken apart. Very, in a very weird way. Led Zeppelin said their own performance was substandard. 
and since then, they've blocked all attempts to broadcast it. And they were in a funny mood during it. And, and Jimmy was dribbling everywhere, and Robert, Robert's voice wasn't sung in. I actually, there's quite a lot of me when I kind of, my hands go up in the air not playing. You know, I'm playing and then there's a fill coming and I sort of just play the air for a bit and then come back in. I could, I did toy with the idea momentarily at that point of walking off. But I couldn't walk off because we'd all be sitting here talking about that now. Led Zeppelin later blamed Phil Collins for their disappointing performance. He said, well, you know, what can you expect? We had one drummer that was halfway across the Atlantic. And we said, well, they don't fucking have a go at me. You guys were off, man. I was, I was together. I knew my stuff. We won't try to put us Back at Wembley, another rock and roll giant was about to fall victim, this time to the BBC's technical gremlins. Why don't you all... Worse was to come. After weeks of schmoozing and ego massaging, pop legend Paul McCartney had finally agreed to take part. He hadn't performed live for six years. I was so unrehearsed, Bob just sort of said, oh, the piano's just round that curtain there, it's just, it's the white one. Went, ah! I couldn't hear anything. I couldn't hear myself or anything, and the crowd was sort of going wild. I couldn't hear anything. And normally you've got a little bit of a monitor or something and you can sort of hit ding, ding, ding. OK, that's my piano. You know, when I've heard, that's my voice, here we go. There was nothing. some sound, but in the stadium, they could hear nothing. And I'm thinking, oh, I'm the guy that told him, you know, about nuts and bolts and tickety-boo. <laughs> I can't hear him. <laughs> I showed him a picture of the sound system, <laughs> and he can't hear it. I wanted to sink into a hole when it all went wrong. He was probably the most important artist for us on the show to give it credibility. And um, I, I've always been a bit sad about that. In fact, never worked for Paul McCartney since. Paul McCartney was seen to himself for nearly two minutes before the sound engineers finally switched on his mic. <laughs> The great thing was that audience joined in. God bless the audience. They joined in and saved the day, you know, and I said it was all right, OK. Having to share, oh, to my eternal shame, having to share a microphone with David Bowie and then seeing later that I'd hogged it. Oh my God, the humiliation. I, I don't believe I've done that. David Bowie. David Bowie. <laughs> David Bowie. That microphone with me. <laughs> The 
the stars trooped on stage for the sing-along that everybody had been waiting for. been so fantastic I wish I'd been there yeah, me because <laughs> I've seen the footage back <laughs> I'm swaying away at the back there lovely singing away like a pub singer pint in one hand lovely <laughs> and I knew <laughs> <What's with laughs> uh, I was kind of walking backwards into the crowd to, to sink into the, you know, I wasn't going to up there start fighting for mics. And Bob grabbed me by the arm and pulled me forward and stuck a mic in my face. So I finally, I did it eventually sing a line on the song. <laughs> grabbed a mic and said, sing. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> and if my ego's a bit bruised later, um, it soon died away. It wasn't a problem, you know, it didn't matter. It wasn't about that at all. It was about pulling it off, and we pulled it off. Just a perfect day Drink sangria in the park And then later When it gets dark we go home In 12 frenzied weeks And against all the odds Bob Geldof had pulled Just off the impossible Donations and tributes to the concerts that captured the conscience of the world have gone on pouring into the young people of Britain and America, moved by the plight of thousands of others, thousands of lives. But they're now talking about an estimated total of 40 million pounds.
The donations were far bigger than anyone could have hoped. More than 50 million pounds for the starving of Africa. And it was a day that no one who lived through it would ever forget. It was one of those moments, and there aren't many of those in life, that everyone has got a common experience of it. Everyone remembers where they were. Everyone remembers what they felt about it. It, it was one of those, one of those little pegs you hang all your other memories on. You're going to read just what you saw. Live it changed forever. The attitude of people who thought nothing could be done about something enormous. Brave. Bollocks. <laughs> Thrash. Big head and twat. And bullying. Cantankerous. Either cunt. Cunt, cunt, and cunt. Difficult. A fucking lunatic. Fucking great. Gift of gab. <laughs> He's a good man. He's irascible. Indignant. Intimidating. He's outrageous. Irish scruffy wanker. Passionate. Pain in arse. Super human being. Stubborn. And rude. combination of him being a horrible stroppy bastard, being incredibly aggressive and forceful, um, having an enormous initiative and drive actually were the things that made this happen. Because if you'd been rather nice and quiet and, you know, self-effacing and self-deprecating, you couldn't possibly have put such an enormous project together. Bob likes his position of power and he uses it pretty well but he can bully at the same time. He can be dominant, uh, ignore all the advice around him when he feels like it. But on the other hand, he can be kind and caring, and he'll listen. What Bob did is he actually went for it and he did it. And, uh, you know, who can say that? Anyone that can criticize him, or anyone that can say, yes, but, you know, it's like, fuck off you, wanker. Because, you know, he actually went out and did it. And he did something that, frankly, I don't know anyone else that could do it. He actually proved that rock and roll can make a difference and musicians can make a difference. And they did and continue to make a difference today. That is democracy. And long live Bob Geldof. <laughs> Back even further in time here on BBC4 on Friday at 8 with the birth of British music. And next tonight we're heading to the States and America's Dirty South with Rich Hall.